Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? Enjoying the camp? Cool. Wonderful. Well, this session, if uh, you didn't plan to be in here, we're doing Drush, uh, an update for 2014. In this session, you're going to hear things you might already know about Drush, some new things about Drush, but big disclaimer, I'm not going to show any plugins for Drush this time. So I've had all the previous years of my Drush, Drush sessions at Drupal Camp LA recorded, and they're uploaded to our YouTube channel. So there, even 2013 has some good bits of information as well that, you know, I only have about an hour to cover stuff. So watch that too, and you'll get some more insight on what's available. How many here are beginners? Okay, so you will get some fundamentals here, but I won't be going over the basic commands. That previous video does it all perfectly for you guys. It gives you good instructions, it breaks it out. I would highly advise that you guys check the 2013 video. The 2012 also has some pretty good stuff like Drush Make. Uh, me and John Romine actually did that session together. So even the last two previous years are very valuable for content. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Chris Charlton. For those that don't know me, I'm a published tech author. I'm a community leader. I've been managing LA Drupal since January of 2008. And I've been actually one of the leading organizers of Drupal Camp LA since 2008 as well. Um, I've been speaking at every Drupal Camp LA since 2007, so I'm very proud to uh, continue to do that. I also am a contributor, modules, patches, what have you, documentation, so I'm very deep into Drupal. I've been using Drupal since essentially 2005. My first book was published about Drupal using Flash as a front end for rich internet applications, and that was in 2007 using Drupal 5. Uh, Drupal 5 was fairly new around that time. A lot of modules are still coming into play. Anybody remember FlexiNode? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 I remember that. So, uh, that and during that period. Uh, so, I actually work at a great company, KWALT. We're based out here in the Southern California area, actually Orange County. Uh, we also have offices in Arizona and Texas. Uh, we do some really, really great work, a lot of Drupal work, stuff outside of Drupal as well. You'll see that we have multiple sessions. I think we have a total of nine sessions here at Drupal Camp from KWALT employees. So definitely tomorrow there's a good chunk of them. I have two sessions myself, and you'll see that at the end of this uh, presentation as well. Uh, so again, we're a full service agency. We do Drupal. We have a lot of experience doing wonderful uh, big sites uh, for universities, for media, entertainment, marketing, all of that stuff under the sun. Uh, and again, experience outside of Drupal as well. So uh, the easy thing is uh, to explain Drush is it's a command line tool to basically control uh, Drupal, to manage, to maintain, to administer, to develop with in Drupal uh, using Drush. Uh, basically, it helps us do a lot of the things that we would do by clicking on the interface, kind of going to an admin screen here, an admin screen there, uh, and actually a lot of stuff that is not even in Drupal's interface at all. Um, and you see the little tagline at the bottom, Using Drush brings your work down to sometimes seconds versus minutes or hours of what it would take you manually, okay? And if uh, something took you hours before, it probably will go down to minutes. And if you refine it a little bit, you could probably get it down to even uh, several seconds of actual hands-on, you know, interactivity yourself. And the robots are doing a lot of the magic. And how does that work? Well, first, let's just review. Um, Drupal has a, you know, a front-end interface, a web-based interface. Love Drupal for having a good administration layer, a great API set that we can actually tie into that administration layer and expand it for our clients, uh, but not just expand, but to customize as well. Uh, where, where it fails though is uh, when you have developers that have to kind of go in and kind of click this, click that, do that, you know, that's a lot of time, it wastes time, especially if you're uh, a development shop or a freelance developer, this is eating up a lot of your time to do a lot of these uh, repetitive tasks if you're doing it over and over again on various multiple sites. Um, but really, there's there's a lot in there that you need to be familiar with in Drupal before Drush starts to really make sense for you. Uh, everything that you do in Drush is usually tied to Drupal uh, when you're in the kind of first two levels of skills, you know, difficulty for Drush. When you start to get into that third layer of difficulty uh, skill sets for Drush, you're breaking outside of Drupal. You're breaking outside of uh, what Drush comes uh, uh, with by default. And then you're exploring things like some of the internals of Drush to 
do the more advanced things, you know, really getting into the nitty gritty documentation to do some magic. And I'm going to go over what that is. So this is the Drupal interface. We're pretty familiar with this. Uh, if you're expecting it to be blue, I like to use the color module to change mine gray. That's just who I am. Uh, but actually, I don't even use this interface to administrate Drupal. Uh, from the front end, I use a, a better administration thing. Uh, two of them that I would recommend for people to check out would be Bartik and Shiny. Okay, those are really, really good administration interfaces. Problem with that though is you're going to get used to those interfaces, and when you come back to this, you're kind of like, oh yeah, that's what Drupal looks like. I forgot, but it's okay. Drush's interface is much simpler and much more complicated at the same time. Okay. Uh, not complicated, but you know, it could be scary, intimidating to a lot of people. Uh, show of hands here, who, who's comfortable with terminal, command line interface, shell script? Oh, good crowd, perfect. You know, majority of you guys raise your hands. So I don't really have to try to explain what this interface is gonna be or look like for you guys. So let's, let's move forward. This is a slide that I love showing. I have actually not updated this slide since 2011. I could update it, but really it still hits home at what its message is and time that you save from Drush versus manual labor in Drupal. So uh, real quick, the dark blue line um, within the, this uh, time graph is Drush and shorter is better because shorter is faster. So we want things to go quick, especially mundane, repetitive items. Uh, downloading Drupal core, so the blue line is Drush, me actually running a Drush command that says Drush DL Drupal. Uh, and it'll actually download Drupal core for me, it'll do the whole thing, put it in a folder, yada, yada, yada. Uh, the light blue time is manual. It's literally me opening the browser tab, typing drupal.org, visiting the download page, clicking the version I want, unpackaging it, putting it in a folder, great. So that doesn't take a lot of time, and if you look at it, it really took me less than 60 seconds, a full minute. I mean, yes, I did actually time myself. Uh, so it's not a lot of time, but imagine you're doing this over and over again. So uh, downloading core, well, that's not that exciting. You know, no big doves flying out of it, big explosions. Let's get going to line items that would actually be much more entertaining. Uh, core plus one module, no difference in time for Drush, but as you see manually, it added a little bit of extra time for me. I have to download Drupal, I have to download that module, okay? Uh, the top 10 modules. Now you see Drush took 30 seconds to do it, but it took me almost 90 seconds. So extrapolate this for literally just over and over again, all your tasks. So uh, enabling the modules, this is another very popular. So Drush is popular for downloading modules, enabling, disabling, uh, but there's a lot more that's in it that I'm gonna show you guys. Uh, but the top 10 modules, the most popular modules, that's something everyone's going to probably download or grab. Uh, as you can see, uh, they're really, it's, it's, it's about a third of the time to even a tenth of the time uh, from the task of Drush doing it versus me doing it manually. And the longest task I have here is downloading core with the top 10 modules coming in at almost 90 seconds manually. But you guys can see that, I mean, the chart, you know, speaks for itself in terms of Drush is just faster at it and it just makes sense to use that. Uh, clearing site caches, how many here are sitting waiting for your browser to reload after you clear a lot of site cache and maybe the site's a little bit big? You know, it takes a minute to churn, a minute. And really at a developer's desk, you're kind of sitting there rolling your eyes, you know, maybe bouncing, you know, a, 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 one of those sque you know, squeeze balls, you know, against the wall pissing off your neighbor and that's fine. Um, but Drush, Drush will actually help keep your neighbor sane because it'll happen so fast that you won't have time to, you know, throw something against the water. Be bored with um, listing a hundred site modules. How many have really just hated how long it takes your module page takes to load? It's just you know if you got yeah if you got I mean any good site is not going to just have only twenty or ten modules. It's going to have probably a good near almost hundred, sometimes even near two hundred, depending on what you have. If you have a multi-site installation, you've got all your modules in one central store that are going to show up. You know, on every every multi-site that you have, that that hurts. Uh, by the way, advanced tip: there is actually a, a sandbox project that helps uh, um, know which modules it already kind of checked. It'll actually create a hash for every module. So the next time that it re, uh, it shows that page, it'll only show stuff that's new. So that's that's a cool sandbox that's out there. Bless you. Um, anyway, so listing a hundred modules, you know, in a site that'll no, take a few seconds, definitely, on my Drupal site. You know, I have APC, I have, you know, Memcache, so these things are making my environment a little bit snappier, for sure, but in Drush, I mean, look, it didn't even really hit one second. I mean, it was instant, basically, you know. 
So it's a big deal to adopt Drush if you haven't already. Um, and the stuff that I'm going to go over today is going to highlight uh, the key things that you'll need for Drush today and immediately tomorrow. Uh, but none of this is super brand new where it's like only in the bleeding edge or a dev version of Drush. So I think you guys will be happy that there are features that we haven't really exposed or really used a lot within the community that is actually going to get everybody moving forward uh, really, really well. So let me, just, uh, let me just highlight where stuff is going for Drush. This chart basically explains the versions of Drush that are out. Right now the dev version is version 7. This is going to probably be in dev. Uh, It'll probably come out of dev before Drupal 8 comes out. You know, there really isn't a one-to-one -one correlation of Drush major versions coming out with Drupal major versions. That isn't really the case. In fact, Drush has actually kind of moved a little bit faster in its major version number uh, over Drupal, of course. Um, but 7 is where it's going to be next, and 7 will actually bring, uh, um, bring uh, Drupal 8 support fully. Uh, there was some Drupal 8 support in Drush 6, but that kind of got shifted or moved around. I'm not too sure exactly what happened, but uh, this is the breakdown, essentially, that you're going to want to uh, take home, which is uh, you should pretty much be on 6, unless I've seen like hosting environments have been stuck on 5. Uh, I'm not going to call anybody out. There's nothing wrong with that. It does a lot of the things you need already. Um, so it, it, it'll work for sure. It's not like, oh my God, it's super old, end of life kind of thing. You'll see Drush 5 support lingering for quite some time. Uh, Drush 6 is all over the place, especially on local dev environments or whatnot. And then of course, 7 will just want to replace both of them. So uh, moving forward, any questions on this slide? Just want to make sure I capture anything. Am I going too fast? All right, good. Just want to make sure. So uh, Drupal developers use Drush. This is a no-brainer, of course. Um, they're Drush daily commands, so those still getting comfortable with Drush. Uh, this is the breakdown. These are the two categories that they fall into. Uh, maintenance and really deployment and development. That's, you know, every time I'm using Drush, it's really in these two buckets of work. So uh, the easy things are like, Give me the status of the site. It'll let you know if it's connected. Uh, clear the cron, clear the cache, download, update. You know, update the modules, update the core, stuff like that. So uh, in the development side, you're always enabling, disabling. But the other ones that are really, really useful are like rsync, which will sync your files. So um, like the uploaded files, you have your production server and people are uploading imagery like, you know, they're adding content. Well, you're going to use the rsync command to bring that back to your local environment or to your dev or to your staging to get those file uploads over there. You're not going to, you're not going to, Download a giant zip file, you know, um, using backup and migrate files plugin to, you know, download a two gig file folder, you know, it just doesn't really make sense. And also, rsync is very smart. It's an old command that does great work on its own to understand, uh, you know, uh, th does it already have this file? Does it want to resume? Does it want to append? So, rsync, we're basically leveraging. There's nothing new in Drush that it has uh, um, kind of started, you know, uh, the construction of the wheel all over again. It's leveraging rsync that's built into Linux, Unix, everything there already. Uh, just kind of wraps something to make it easy for us. So if you haven't, if you maybe have used SQL sync for your database where it brings a copy of your database down to your environment, uh, people use that a lot. Um, but I, I, I see rsync used not as much as SQL sync. And you know, that, that might be fine because you're like, oh, I don't care about the uploads. And that's, that's your prerogative. Um, but really with it being such a simple command, um, you know, should you really be working with a half-broken site on your local environment? It's your prerogative, but it's such an easy command, you might want to think about merging these two together. And there's actually information later on how to kind of do that, both in one kind of one swoop. Um, the other commands that are uh, uh, less often used are uh, not as um, convenient, but they're very useful, which is ARD and ARR. These are the shortcuts of basically archive dump and archive restore. So for those, um, you know, you're syncing, you're doing a SQL sync or an RC, and that's making a copy and, you know, it goes live right away, but sometimes some people just want to have a, like a, an archive dump, you know, just give me all the site, give me the files or give me the database and just put it in a folder. And you really using this for storage, for backup, for, you know, a, a third tertiary backup, something like that, you know, this is very easy to do. So these commands are there. Uh, in fact, I would think some people uh, who are not comfortable with the syncing or if there's like some port issue, uh, you could use the, uh, you know, the um, archive dump 
to essentially create a dump file to download and then you know kind of restore it you know manually. So some people might actually like these commands because they might they might not be so automated. And, you know they might kind of be a little bit more um, I guess for lack of a better term uh, a little bit slower of a process. So that might be something that their comfort level might be you know they might be happy with because they see the little you know Gunzip file there and they're like ah it's all there you know. Um, and it's just, again, like I said, prerogative. Uh, and then Make. Uh, you know, Make is very popular when you're starting a site. A lot of people don't know, though, you can use Make in the middle of development. So let's say you run a Make file to get started and, you know, it, it got you your first, uh, you know, uh, 100 modules. And I'm just using general numbers here. Um, but then somebody comes over and goes, we're adding e-commerce to this site. And there's 30 modules that we want to integrate with, which is commerce, a lot of these plugins, and then maybe some other cool things that, you know, are going to help, like conversion rates and tracking or Google Analytics uh, product integration. So, you know, you're like thinking, oh, well, I'll get the one e-commerce module. Well, really, there will be a bunch of other plugins that you're probably going to need, payment processors that might be specific, stuff like that. And, you're, uh, you know, it, the, the, um, the common way is I run my make file. You know, for people who don't know that you can use make more than once. I run my make file, it assembles some of the things initially, but now I'm using Drush DL to kind of download the individual modules that I need after the fact. Uh, when really you can run make later on just that small list of those modules being added to a project. So within a development team, if there's a number of modules, whether it's even three or, you know, 50, uh, you, you know, somebody could create a make file that just lists those modules really easily. And then a developer could say, all right, site, go use that make file, it won't download core again for you, it'll just add those files, you know, the, those new modules in there. Uh, and then also actually, if you're a module maintainer or you're making custom modules, uh, consider looking at including a make file with it if there's external dependencies like a JavaScript library or a patch on Drupal.org that should be applied to this. You know, uh, you're, the make file is going to do all of that dirty work for you guys over and over again. So it's much more valuable than just spawning a new site. Okay. So that's a big one that I don't see used enough. Excuse me. Oh. And I don't mean used enough, uh, but I mean, you know, use in a capacity that they can really uh, um, uh, um, break outside of, you know, the kind of um, um, the basics, the basic usage. Okay. Making sense? Um, make? Okay, so that's a big one. Now, these are very important to me. Uh, I, in fact, I gave them color on my slides. Uh, you, you know, big, bright, beautiful colors, and they're in order. So these are what I would call Drush's user experience features. Okay, uh, Drush, you know, there are GUIs out there. This is not what I'm talking about. This is the developer's experience of using Drush outside of those basic commands that we just saw. Right, so these are those commands, but this is this is the stuff that's in Drush that I'm really going to try to hit home in this presentation. That's different from the previous years. Okay, so I'm going to spend a good time on these uh, site aliases. Show of hands, how many have adopted site aliases? I'm sad not to see more hands up. Okay, so I've been pushing site aliases for probably three years now, uh, and what site aliases do, and we'll come back to this slide. Um, essentially, it lets you create these shortcut names. For Drush to understand a website. So if I was running a website that was uh, rubberbabybottles.com, that's a long title and I, you know, there could be some manual error when I'm typing in Drush, please update or download to this one website in a multi-site setup. Uh, well, that can actually be shortcutted. You can kind of shrink that down to a little alias. And you see here in the slide, uh, Drush at dev, and it's that dev is in yellow. That's the alias. I just called it at dev to make it simple. But I could call this uh, rubber, baby, RBB. I mean, anything that makes sense to me. And you can name these also per environment. So that's actually a best practice, which is you're going to have something for dev, you're going to have something for stage and for prod. Uh, you can go way outside. Those are not the only three you need. Uh, you can have any number, an almost an unlimited number, I mean, based on your RAM limits. And everybody's got high RAM now, so it's not a big problem. But aliases, for the people who did not raise your hand, this is the one feature that I would say, if you walked away with today, one thing, that's the one thing I really, really, really am begging you to just be super comfortable with. Get everybody using it. You don't have to teach your grandma, but teach your, your dev team, okay? This is a big thing that you guys really, as soon as a site gets made and there's a make file and a settings PHP and you've got all that beginning process, 
the site aliases from Drush should be in that first step process. You know, in site build and assembly, not development, literally just prep. So the first developer that's coming in to do real hard labor, real production work, those aliases should be there and ready for them. Does this make sense? The benefits that they get right away, you don't want your developer sitting there and trying to make up these aliases. You want to have an easy standard that everybody follows. And technically, if you have a, you know, a really good scripting team, they can generate these on the fly. You can automate this stuff to basically be populated and sitting there and push it in the Git repo, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Aliases also become even more powerful when you're using it with other commands outside of just the basic status, you know, DL, up, all that stuff. Uh, the aliases are actually critical when you're using a feature like SQL sync or rsync. Okay, this is how you tell it, go from here to there. So in this command example, I'm going SQL sync from prod to dev. Okay, so now literally my production database, it could be out on the internet, it could be on Mars, it could be anywhere else, doesn't matter. The alias has encapsulated all of that information and it uses SSH keys. Uh, you, can, you can literally have the password pasted into the alias, if that's not good, um, but some people do it. You know, whatever works, whatever's gonna make your job easier, okay? and really better. Uh, the flag at the end of that SQL sync example though, the dash dash sanitize, it's in blue. How many have used that? Okay, now I am additionally disappointed that only one. Um, for those that are pulling down production databases, you have customer emails, you might have customer data, phone numbers, birthdays, maybe even just their full name. It could be any of that stuff, it could be all of it. You're gonna to wanna to really get into that sanitize feature. So what that does is you guys can create your own uh, kind of string replacements, if you will. So what it could do is it could replace everybody's email address in the database dump before it comes to you, you know, down. So from a security and compliance perspective, whether you're in HIPAA, whether you're in PCI compliance, I mean, any of these things, you're, you're going to find documentation somewhere. It might be small, but there's always gonna be a reference and sanitize your data. That's part of compliance. Well, there's never really deep instruction on what to sanitize. It's anything that can you know, be personal information, even my last name, and technically even maybe my first name could be considered personal, very private. So really, if you don't need the actual user's real data, you just need data, you can basically have it change every phone number to be 555-5555-5555. You know, everyone's email address could be uh, user ID number at example.com. So, you know, and actually a really cool thing is uh, that's uh, one of the easy ways that your developers won't accidentally email out the actual customers, okay? There's actually better practices to block or reroute emails for development, but this is one of those easy, low-hanging fruits that you can kind of just feel good at. when they're syncing down to their dev environments, they're not going to accidentally email everybody out, you know, in their client list or something like that. Question? So the question was, do you configure with Get Sanitized? Yes. And uh, within Drush's um, uh, documentation, like the sample code that they have, uh, they actually do offer already a couple of the most popular things, like an email, uh, and I think uh, um, uh, it was email and password. So you're even sanitizing their passwords. You're going to change their passwords to be garbly goop, random, or maybe everybody is 111111, something like that, for your local version, of course. Okay. So it's, it's very useful. It's great, and again, if you're dealing with any regulatory compliance, anything, this is a key feature for you to institute once and live with forever, okay, on every project. Did you have a question? No? Okay. So coming back to my list real quick, site aliases, uh, you know, on the surface, it allows you to definitely to jump between environments and check things, move things around. I mean, this is, again, like I said, the green, box feature right here. If you're not, if you don't have that yet, that's the first thing I want you to take away. The next ones are a little bit higher in difficulty and complexity, so that's why I color coded them. Kind of, they're starting to go, but none of them are red because I don't want anybody to be scared. Uh, none of this is dangerous. Uh, it's just you know new. So I just want to show you guys visually, you know, the steps, the the progression of Drush. Okay, and again, these are all built in the Drush core, so this is not like something new in Dev on 7 or coming in Drush 8. This is like Drush since Drush 5 and maybe even 4, okay, parts of it. Uh, some of it probably just got better in 6 and 7, 
Okay, so site aliases, we cover that. Are we good with that? Any questions on site aliasing? No? All right, good. Next one, built into Drush course, shell aliases. How many of you shell aliases in Drush? I'm expecting one or two, okay? And that's what I just got, okay. This is where stuff starts to get really fun, okay? So let's jump into that real fast. So I have to kind of flip through these, sorry. Da, da, da. Okay, so shell aliases, okay? These are different from site aliases, okay? Shell aliases allow you to create like site aliases, a short form of something, anything, um, a command. Um, really, it could be a super long 2,000 character type command, but you can make it one letter if you really wanted to. So what we see in this example here is a shell alias. Uh, you know, Drush will understand that if you just type the word pull, you know, it's going to actually run git pull. So what people don't also know is if your Drush is set up properly, you won't actually have to prefix these shell aliases with the command Drush. So I wouldn't necessarily, if I set up my machine right, I don't have to type Drush pull. I could, and Drush will understand, but I could actually just use the word pull. And then Drush being in my path, if people are familiar with that, it's going to actually just boot up Drush. Drush is going to understand, read its shell alias uh, manifest, and then it's going to find your command, which was just a simple word pull, and it's going to run whatever it was. So, my well, you know, I'm in Drush all day and Git. Yeah, there's times that I accidentally, and you know, this is an example that's been given before, you type Drush pull and you're like, ah, oh, dummy me, it's Git pull. Well now, by just exposing this little alias, even if you messed up, the machine's going to do what you expected it to do. Now we're going to start getting a little bit bigger in these commands. So there'll be this one and then one more bigger one. So another shell alias is non-core. Uh, when you're listing uh, the uh, list of modules on a website, you, all, you, know, you get core and then everything else. And there's this flag dash dash no core that will not show you any of the core modules and only the contrib ones that are installed. Um, it's a great flag. I always forget that there's a hyphen in the middle. I always type no core kind of one word. Ah, it complains or it doesn't give me what I want. Oh, I forgot that hyphen. Uh, no more. So uh, I use this shell alias and it'll give me a list of everything outside of you know core. You could then make an alias of maybe just core and you want to see you know what's enabled or not. So you can really do anything you want. These are not limited to uh, um, uh, you know a single command list pool anything like that. These can go bigger and even uh, more complex. Let me show you one of those. So the shell alias in yellow, sync dev, would automatically understand and pull this whole command here, which is basically drush SQL sync prod and dev and rsync. So this is a database and a file pool in one. Okay, so how many here would think that that's useful? I get the files on the environment and the database. Right, so this is where shell aliases start to really become valuable. Um, you don't, if you notice in the first item, there's the git pool is not a drush command, that's a git command. So your shale aliases could really call anything that you want, okay? Does this make sense? Seem valuable? Because it's ultra valuable. If internally you guys have standards or you guys have your own commands or flags or whatever, you guys can make this a little bit easier on your team by not giving them long flags and long command sets to remember, but maybe encapsulate it into a couple shell aliases. You know, you can even brand them. You can make them company specific. So like us at KWAL, maybe we might have a set of KWAL dash something. Okay. You know, check on maybe to check client servers or to get a report. It could be really anything. Okay. So don't, you know, don't think that these are just some fun one-offs for my machine. Really think about, hey, what are we doing over and over again? You know? And if your team is all using Drush, there's a feature in there that actually tracks your usage. Uh, how many here use like productivity tools like Quicksilver and Alfred and you know and all that? All of those tools do a usage tracking, you know, kind of uh, the feature. You can shut them all off, of course, but you know they show you, hey, I saved you 26 minutes today because of all the commands you wrote, or you type 10,000 commands and it would have taken a normal human an hour to do all of that in a day and you got it in 10 seconds. So there's all this kind of movement on productivity. Well, Drush, by default, uh, has disabled a feature that you could turn on that helps report to the Drush team what commands you're using over and over again. That lets them know really where the big chunk of work is being spent in Drush. 
basically what commands are the most popular. You can reroute internally in Drush, it's very simple, to reroute and log it on your own servers privately. Then internally, your team can then digest that stats, that set of stats, and say, hey, we keep doing this a lot, and it looks to be like a super stupid long command. In fact, also maybe we're noticing errors, because you can track the errors too. So you're like, okay, we keep fudging this command over and messing it up. Let's, let's think about some things that'll make this easier. And then that's when you can start to uh, strategize around shell aliases to be much more valuable for your organization. Real quick, I wanna call out in the rsync line you see at the bottom, the per colon percent files. There are a lot of these, um, uh, these I, I guess I'll, there's a proper term, but I'll just use the term loosely, that there's like these kind of uh, um, uh, variables almost, right? There's these special variables. Um, by default, percent files, Drush knows that that means the file directory. So it doesn't matter what the full path is. You use percent files, Drush will know, ah, this is a special keyword for Drush. I'm gonna go dig into you know, the whole configuration of the Drupal site to understand what the path is for the public files folder. So you don't have to give it the exact path. That's great. That makes your commands actually much more abstract to be reused and reused and reused. Okay. Questions? Yes. Uh, uh, so there, um, there, good question. So the question was, are you creating these shell aliases on the command line itself, or is this some sort of a, a plugin or a manifest file that you're saving this in? Uh, yes, there is actually a file, what's known as Drush RC, and that is what you would have in your home folder, in a dot Drush folder that's basically going to be hidden by most popular operating systems. Uh, your Drush RC file would be all of your customizations to Drush. So, like, even one thing is uh, the no core flag you see up there, if you always want your PM dash list or PML is the shortcut is, every time you list your uh, modules, if you always want it to be no core in your Drush RC file, you could say, hey, every time that command's run, always add this flag. There, that Drush RC file, by the way, is one of the best files to read through for Drush because you'll see a lot of things you're like, I would like to turn that on by default. I want that to happen by default. And then that's one of the files that you definitely will want to check in to get for yourself because you don't want to lose those those customizations because you know it it literally is like the uh it's the file you tweak as if if drush had a gui it would be the prefs you know the preferences you know you're toggling things on and off or there's a list of options uh, that's what the drush rc file essentially gives you drupal prefs you know customize um the percent file is the last piece i want to bring up about these tokens there you go uh these uh these command tokens um, percent files is what's built into Drush, and there's a few more. It's really about, I think, like a handful to at most under a dozen. You can create your own, okay? So uh, there's like percent, oh gosh, I don't even want to, let me see. The, the example I would give you would be if you guys had some unique folder or anything unique to your kind of infrastructure, okay, percent cloud, I don't care what that means to me. It might mean something different to you. You guys can make up whatever you guys really, really want. Okay, um, it's uh, it becomes a rabbit hole for some people, you know. But it is one of those where I honestly think that even if you try to over-engineer your set of tokens, uh, you would be hard pressed to really, really get far. You know, there's not a lot of pieces or components to Drupal that, you know, this path and this path, there's a lot built into Drush already, so you won't have to repeat those, like the directory, the, uh, the Drupal directory itself, the sites directory itself, you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the public files folder, the private files folder, the temp folder, you know, all of those basically are already discoverable and built into Drush. You want to expand outside of that, something that makes sense to you and or your project, okay? Any last questions on shell aliases? No? Okay. So I've covered site aliases and you guys seem to enjoy that. Everybody always does. Uh, that's a big, uh, it's a big sale thing. Uh, everybody likes that in Drush. And in fact, I would say uh, besides downloading and enabling modules and updating modules, uh, everybody gravitates towards site aliases at some point. That's like the next step that they take. Uh, shell aliases, like I said, are not used enough and they're very powerful. Again, these are great tools drastically underutilized within the Drush community or the Drupal community at large.
The final set is shell scripts. Okay, these are different. These are Drush shell scripts, and these are somewhat almost no different than regular shell scripts, and that's the purpose of this feature. So I'll get into that in a second right here. So uh, shell scripts allow you to essentially have Drush do things that break right outside of Drush uh, or break outside of Drupal entirely. So let me, uh, let me jump over to my example. And I actually will show you the documentation pages uh, um, from Drush for these. So sorry, I gotta go through this. Oh, I have one more shell alias. How many people on a server are trying to remember how to restart Apache for the server, right? You know, it, it's a command that unless you've really been doing it daily, you're kind of like, whoa, 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 is this? So uh, this is an easy one. Uh, I think this is actually one of my favorites. I just forgot it was on the list here. But now Drush can restart your Apache easy. Seem useful? I think so. Okay, but anyway, we're talking about shell scripts, Drush shell scripts. So uh, Drush shell script, essentially you can make a, uh, a shell file, .sh file, a real shell script, um, and Drush can call that shell script. Your command line can call it anyway. So what is the difference? Context. You can provide Drupal and Drush oriented context to a shell script without having to really do a lot of crazy mumbo jumbo for your shell script to work with Drush. Okay, let me show you how. Um, right here we have uh, what would be at the start. Um, and actually I should ask, how many here have written a shell script before? Okay, so you know there's the shebang at the beginning, right? And depending what you put at the beginning, it's then interpreted differently, okay? So when you want to use the Drush API in your shell script, and you're going to exclusively stay within Drush commands, uh, you can actually uh, invoke Drush to be the, uh, the shell environment that it will understand to run whatever comes under it. So this is uh, um, the pound uh, um, exclamation and whatever's coming after it with the keyword Drush at the end right there you see. That is giving an indication to the shell, hey, you, whatever comes after this, you're going to run this under Drush. Okay, So this is where you can make a cool script that maybe will do your syncing for you, and maybe it'll do a backup before the sync, so you can timestamp that. Um, you know, For your deployments, you can kind of do that as well. You can make these as complex as you want uh, within the world of Drush commands, of course. But uh, that only is uh, so entertaining when you're only doing Drush commands. But we live in a world where Drupal is becoming the octopus, right, of CMS frameworks. You know, it's, 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 we hear about headless Drupal, it's growing, it's breaking away, it's getting off the island, yada, yada. This is a paradigm that all projects are moving towards, okay? So we saw the open source CMS, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, rush, if you will, right? The CMS, open source CMS rush in 2005, then 2006 and 2007, and it just started to grow from there. Um, the Drupal and other frameworks and other systems are now also following the same pattern together because they've all matured to a point where they go, oh, we have to start to break away from building it all ourselves. Okay, when Drupal introduced jQuery and a couple other ones, or a couple other little pieces from other places, that was great. Now they've got Symphony, now there's Backbone underscore. So there's a lot of that, but there's a lot more out there. And you're, you guys aren't seeing the full list because really the list just starts to get exponentially large. Okay, when we want to break out of Drush and we want to break out of Drupal, we want some more advanced because maybe we have some very complex scripts or commands or processes that you know a deployment or anything in our process has to go through. Maybe there's a lot of content migration. Maybe you're integrating with an old ISO, you know, uh, 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 data set, something old, something ugly and archaic. Well, that might be a whole set of uh, shell scripts. Um, so we can't do that within Drush, right? We have to break out. We have to use our normal shell scripts. So how do we really kind of tie that together? Well, we basically just change the interpreter at the top to not invoke Drush as the environment for the shell script, but essentially say, uh, you know, use Drush, the executable, not as an environment, but the Drush system understands that this change up here is going to actually include things that are not Drush oriented below. So that means you can have, you can literally take one of your shell scripts now, copy the whole thing, and paste it into one of these, 
with this shebang, and Drush will do the whole thing as expected. You could write, really, scripts in PHP if you really want to, if you're not a, a bash script head. You could write things in PHP and then have this call the PHP interpreter to run that PHP script to do something. So really, when I highlight that this is the start for anything, I almost get overwhelmed uh, you know, at, at what the possibilities are you know, uh, for you guys, you know, what you guys could do with this, because there's so many scenarios, uh, you know, but we do a lot of the same best practices that um, it, it's, it's tough to describe this. So I'm gonna wanna show you guys uh, you know, with this example and of course the documentation. So this is an example, if uh, I wrote like a hello world, obviously that's boring, but you know, this is, this is me just trying to explain the feature. By running it through Drush, with a Drush shell script shebang, you know, piece at the top, um, now we have the script file, and you see we're using a site alias, the at dev that's in green. Okay, if I were to throw that into a normal shell script that I didn't account for, well, that's going to be an ignored argument. By running our shell scripts through Drush, now we provided context of Drupal and or Drush itself. So now Drush is going to know, hey, I'm going to have this context of a site alias called at dev that's going to be brought in. And there's going to be other things after at the end as well that will be easy to bring in, as we see here with the A, the B, and the C. Okay, so if you sat there and you're thinking, well, this Drush command is great, but it doesn't do this one tiny extra little thing. I wish it had a dash dash, you know, whatever. Well, now that's you creating a Drush plugin or you patching Drush to have that feature for you. You don't, you really kind of don't even want to do that. In fact, I'm a big advocate now of don't make another Drush plugin. There's a lot of them out there. Okay, in fact, there's almost too many sometimes and they're very singular. Your team would be able to get away with, and you'll see in a slide, looking at shell scripts through Drush and, and, and uh, shell aliases through Drush that will leverage your site aliases in Drush. And you start to see this chain starts to really grow, and it doesn't become a crazy you know, amalgamated monster. It's, it's really linear. You know, you're going to start with your site aliases, then you're going to look at maybe making some simple short scripts with your shell aliases, and then your script, your shell scripts are actually going to use those site aliases and those shell aliases. Okay, so you kind of see how this starts to build on top of itself. Okay, so the the whole point of the whole factor that you can bring in context to a regular script now lets you break right outside and do some really awesome things. Word of advice: Don't have a single script do everything. It's still a standard script, so it can run includes, it can run logic, it can do you know path-oriented logic. So don't think, oh my god, it has to all live in this one file. Let's do the whole thing. No, 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 no. You want to continue with your best practices around shell scripts, all that stuff. You know, using includes, maintenance, separating tasks, and then literally just have it come together or be assembled or you know have. You treat this like as your singleton, you know, the, the something that's going to fire off, you know, something only once and then, you know, everything else goes and loops or goes whatever it wants. So, um, yeah, this is like literally your single conduit, you know, it'll, it, it'll start the lightning, if you will. So uh, let, me, let me break this real quick. I am running 43 minutes. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, shell aliases, here's the documentation from Drush for shell aliases. So you see that there were the two examples that I gave you guys earlier today. Uh, there's actually also that, that example where it does the rsync and the SQL sync. So that's not a command I came up with on my own. It's a command I thought I came up on with my own until I went into the docs and was like, oh, somebody had the same idea as me. Okay, so they're a genius too. Uh, this is a very valuable snippet though. So this is what you, yeah, thanks. Uh, so this is what you're going to literally want to lift and make sure you're using it in your shell aliases within Drush. But we're talking about shell scripts. Like I pointed out, you get to execute stuff. There is a permission here that you're going to want to make sure that you take care of. So you saw my slide, the file, the shell script ended in dot script. This example shows dot drush. Both of those are valid. Technically, you don't even need those but it helps differentiate what's a standard bash shell script, that's .sh, versus something that might be a Drush shell script. So for a naming convention, it actually does kind of help. It does provide a little bit of context, but you don't have to stick to that naming convention. You could change it. 
and please put comments because if these things are doing a lot of tasks, you definitely want to be verbose even in your comments because one, that's not going to affect performance, right, on the script running, and it's going to help your team obviously have the information in line and understand what to hack, I mean, what to change. Yeah. Um, but uh, here's, a, here's an easy one. If you, uh, if you actually have some code that is written in a PHP file, uh, Drush can run any PHP file. It can execute it, which is the PHP script uh, uh, command for Drush. So I can have it, like if you have like a migration routine or you just have something that will iterate through some nodes or something and you are happy in PHP, Drush loves that you write them in PHP and you run it through the PHP dash script command. It'll run it. Uh, but you actually can do more because now you can provide more options. You're, normally you would just say PHP script, here's a script file name, .php, go do it. But I couldn't give it arguments. They, that was a limitation before. That limitation is now broken. Okay, so now we can do, we can send flags in. Drush will understand how to provide them as arguments and then your basically your PHP file should be accepting them as like uh, like a, you know like what you would do with like a, a get you know a get or a post a query string kind of parameter type thing. So because you don't have a get and you don't have a post per se, this is how you're going to actually be able to get that within the command line within the Drush ecosystem. Making sense? Seeming valuable? Okay. We saw this example, of course. That was the one that I had up uh, on the board. Uh, and running a script, throwing in an alias, and even throwing in whatever arguments you want it to be there. Okay, so here's some other examples here. I'm not going to obviously show everything because really this is built into Drush. So if you've installed Drush, this file, this this doc page is sitting on your computer waiting for you to just look at it. Okay, grab all of these examples. These are some of my super favorite pieces of Drush, uh, and I can't stress enough that they're not used enough. Um, and really, as you'll see in my next slide, I'm a big advocate. So instead of creating new Drush modules, new Drush plugins, which there's nothing wrong with doing that, okay? But you don't have to, you don't have to put that investment in anymore. You don't have to think of it as, oh, it's a plugin to Drush. Um, consider, like I said, doing a Drush shell script instead. Because if it's really, if you're encapsulating a shell script or encapsulating logic, and you're wrapping it as a Drush plugin, that might be just maybe just like one minute tad of not overkill, but you don't have to get so formal, if that makes sense, to try to tie it in. Uh, the Drush shell scripts will actually do more for you uh, than a regular little plugin because the plugin is going to be limited to kind of the, uh, the Drush API, unless you're really kind of breaking out and doing some extra magic. The shell script will let you do that magic outside of Drush or Drupal instantly. So why not use the tool that is meant you know, for that? What is funny is you could create a Drush module that actually runs a shell script for Drush. So you know, the, the, these things can get, um, uh, you know, you can kind of get the, uh, the Russian doll effect uh, very quickly, uh, which actually might work for your team as long as, again, things are documented and understood. Uh, instead of using, or instead of creating a new Drush module, uh, use your continuous integration server Use your task server. Your task server could run not just Drush, but not just shell scripts as well, but your Drush shell scripts as well too. So you can actually encapsulate these and really make the robots do the work for you. Okay, so Drush shell scripts are very valuable for when you're using like Jenkins or Chef or something like that. They, you know, again, you're encapsulating, you're making things simpler. So now even when you're looking at your recipes, you know, um, uh, your, your manifest list for the tasks, they're even smaller because you have this encapsulation, you know, and it's referencing files. So those files are now in Git. Okay. Uh, and then um, it, it, as a last resort, uh, instead of creating a whole new Drush module, a last resort, if there's a contrib module that is doing it for Drupal, consider actually doing the Drush plugin for that contrib module instead of something from scratch. So as I told you, run it, do a, a Drush shell script yourself. Um, but if you see that there's a module that kind of does that already, maybe you just need to do some sort of command and some Drush style integration for that. So um, you know, because I'm advocating, don't go create another module. You know, don't create another plugin. Um, part of that advocacy is also consider wrapping something that's already done. 
because that, that work might be already there and you're contributing back, so it might help. Uh, real quick to kind of round out the night, uh, I'm gonna give you a couple, uh, uh, two tips. Uh, Drush module development tip. If you're doing Drush modules, you don't wanna use the print command. Uh, that's to output text onto the screen. You know, it's like, hey, finished my process. You wanna use the return command, why is that? Well, Drush does more than just command line output, just string. It actually can do formatted output. You can get JSON, you can get XML. So now Drush doesn't have to be just for you on your little machine or when you're tied in. Drush actually could be queried by your continuous integration, by your reporting, by your security suites to then say, run this and give me some data back to then report or to bubble up or to chew on. Um, so you don't want to do a string parsing of a Drush command. That's just going to be crazy. But you, if you get it in a format, uh, something organized like JSON or XML, now you can start to integrate this in ways that people probably never thought within your company. Okay. If you have a dashboard that is maybe auditing all your websites and how they're doing, you know, their uptime or when they last did cron, Really, to bring all that together, you're gonna to want to query Drush. You're gonna want something there. You're gonna want Drush to kind of go out and collect that information. You might want to store it too, so you're not beating every site up all the time to query. But really, uh, the return command is gonna understand, it's gonna wrap it properly. So now you can even start working on Ajax front ends that are maybe querying a simple page that is querying Drush that's bringing back JSON. So now you're not doing the JSON wrapping. You're not doing that transformation of any you know, ugly, static, flat kind of responses. Make sense? Okay. By the way, if you didn't know Drush did JSON and XML outputs for your command returns, uh, I would definitely, if that intrigues you, go check it out. It literally is like a 20 second thing to like try yourself in Drush once you see what, it, you know, what you need for it. And then it opens a whole world of, oh my gosh, we can do more with this. Um, again, even just querying, you know, that kind of stuff. Question? Yeah. Uh, so I thought I had a second tip, and actually I think it was this one. <laughs> uh, you know, when to choose to actually code something or not. Um, well, I want to say thanks. Uh, I have a session tomorrow. Uh, it is the new Cloud Lightning for Drupal. This is a, a, a big project that I released a couple weeks ago. So if you're considering or you are hosting Drupal in the cloud, come check out my session or check out the open source project called Cloud Lightning. It's on GitHub for free. It's basically the cheat sheet and the collection of all the good settings.php changes that you're going to want for the cloud. If you have a dev or you should have dev staging and prod, uh, this actually allows you to toggle things uh, between them. It's very simple. And what I'm trying to do is make things easy for people to basically just slap that into their site, their settings.php file, and then see Drupal go faster. Because the recipes are done, you don't need uh, a super long book unless you need some background information on these caching layers and what they do. Really, it's uh, just a, a few hundred lines of, no, sorry, it's, it's, it's just several, several lines of, you know, configs. But that's what my session next, tomorrow, will be covering, and also the information is online. Thank you. Any questions for Drush? And again, I want to leave, you, I want to leave this burned into your brain. This, again, these are Drush core features, so I didn't have to go over plugins today because these three features are so powerful on their own and they're not utilized enough that I would beg you guys to say, hey, there's literally these features in Drush that are supposed to be awesome for us to utilize. Let's look at them and see how they can really affect positively within our organization and individually as developers and sysadmins. You know, don't limit Drush or integration with Drush to just the Drush developers, okay? Your InfoSec team could use it to query. Maybe their reports might have different commands, okay? Your QA team might have a whole suite of different commands and, uh, you know, uh, shell alias, I mean, shell scripts for Drush. So, again, don't think Drush is only for the Drupal developer. You got sysadmins in there, you got DevOps, you got uh, maintenance people, you got a lot of other people, maybe even your clients and customers not giving them Drush, but maybe doing something that, you know, you haven't thought of because it was going to be extra work. Maybe these features will actually help you get that work done faster and easy to maintain, easier, you know, something unwieldy. Any final thoughts? Anybody want to share anything about Drush that they like? Question? Demystify something? You want to code a module right now? No? 
I figured as much. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the calendar.